What makes a person of interest? Coach Michael Burke cuts to the chase, interviewing some of the biggest names in the world. How do they think? What makes them tick? What are their thought processes? And how they became a person of interest. All right, good afternoon. This is Coach Michael Burt. I believe everybody needs a great coach in life, and I believe that we all aspire to become people of interest in the world. I love interviewing uh, some of the most fascinating people in the world, and I came across a book not long ago called Wealth Can't Wait uh, from David Osborne, who is a New York Times bestseller. Wealth Can't Wait has become a passionate educator, sharing with candor, I love that, his journey to financial freedom and the well-cultivated methodologies that helped him get there. Today, help David has built and is the co-owner of the top real estate brokerages in the world, more than 5,000 agents and annual sales volume exceeding $12 billion. He's also founded over 50 companies, which we'll get into, uh, and at least 25 that are ongoing profitable uh, centers. David's continued success allows the freedom to pour time into his priorities, being the best father and husband to his wonderful family, and giving back to other people. David, welcome to Person of Interest. Hey, it's great to be with you, Coach Michael. I'm looking forward to a killer conversation today. Yeah, you're an interesting cat, man. I want to, uh, you, you're, you're an interesting cat. You're living, I think people of interest live fascinating lives. They do fascinating things. They create fascinating products and services. And you have really built a life of leverage. And I think a lot of people struggle with this. Why is that? Why does the average cat out there in the world struggle to understand leverage? I was a women's basketball coach for a decade. I didn't know the difference, David, between an asset and a liability when I, until yeah. I was 31 years old. Uh, I was raised by a single mom who never taught me some of those things. And so why do you think that, why do you think the average person out there in the world struggles to really understand this concept of leverage and real wealth? Well, leverage, you know, there, from my perspective, there's three kinds of leverage, but I, the first, you know, the most important one to great success is people leverage, right? And the reason people don't understand people leverage is we're really not taught it. There's no time in your life that you learn to take your little brother, for instance, and say, hey, you gather the wood, I'll split the wood. I mean, maybe you do a little bit of that, but you're not really designed to take advantage of, you know, what a capitalist system offers. What a capitalist system offers is a bunch of people raising their hands saying, hey, I want to get paid. And, you know, I want to earn a living. And if you could figure out, okay, here's how you could make a living and that, and, and you do this piece and you make a living over here doing this piece. And eventually you can build an organization where you're leveraging the skills of a lot of different people to create an outcome. Now, of course you did that as a basketball coach. It probably wasn't called that. It was called team play or winning a championship or all the great things you taught people. And so you instinctively did it, but it's exactly how a great business runs. A business runs by finding people that are passionate and serious about doing what they want to do. By the way, that could be as simple as answering the phone and being on the front desk with a happy attitude and an amazing spirit and enthusiasm, right? That doesn't mean, you know, there's a role for everybody. Some people are happy doing that. That's all they want. In fact, sometimes I think those are the smarter people because they don't stay awake all night worrying about all the stuff they've gotten themselves into. Uh, other people want to lead and they want to charge the hill and they want to always be at the front yelling, let's take this hill. And those guys are your leaders, your managers, your, your sales managers, and you, and you need to hire a lot of those to charge up the hill. And, you know, that's what leverage is. It's putting the right people in the right spots. Um, and people just don't do it because we're not taught it. Most of us are taught, hey, I, I'm just going to throw this on my shoulders and I'll do it. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, I can't find any good people. Nobody does it right. I got to do it myself. Uh, so they just overdo and they, they, they actually run people off that are talented because they're so busy being micromanagers. Or secondly, they just don't even try or don't even have the awareness of it. So that's the people leverage piece. The other two are systems and capital, but you can come back to that or not as you will. The people leverage is what will change your life. If you want to live an amazing life, it's all about people leverage. Where did, where did, where did you have that revelation? Where did that come from with you? When did you... Well, yeah. So first off, my dad's military. So is it the, the military kind of understands this to some degree. My dad was a Green Beret colonel and when he retired and, and a full bird colonel. And so I was drug around the country, the world. But the second piece would be joining Gary Keller at Keller Williams. I mean, I'm just lucky enough. <clears throat> you talk about always having a coach. Gary Keller is a phenomenal business coach. And he was, um, you know, I, I joined, you know, I was around him at age 16 when he was 26, starting Keller Williams on a regular basis. So um, I, I didn't work for him then. My mom was his first or one of his fifth, you know, top five agents, first five agents in a company that now has 187,000. Uh, I came to work for Gary full time in 1994 when I was 27, I believe. And uh, yeah, Gary was a huge teacher. And one of the 
teachings he taught you is he said, put, put, put one circle in the middle and then five beneath it. And now write down the name of your five people that report to you. Those are your five wealth determiners. And as good as those five people are, will determine your level of success in life. And at that time, I had one person working for me. I was an agent and I had an assistant who was the beer cart sales girl from the golf course. I'd hired her because I thought she had a nice personality, which she did. The problem was she didn't have much of a work ethic, which is maybe why she was a beer cart salesperson on a golf course. So she always did about 60% of her job. So every day I'd come in and I'd be like, oh, hey, I see you're still here with a nice smile on your face. I wonder which half of your job you're going to do today. And that was my experience. So when I wrote that down, I was like convicted. I was like, oh my gosh. So at that time, I think I was working, you know, uh, 70, 80 hours a week, not taking any days off trying to build my sales career. But I had no concept of you know, I just figured you could hire anybody and they'd get the job done. And, and that was the beginning of the, you know, the, the mental grab getting of it. But of course, you're around it all the time. And, you know, there's no uh, uh, Phil Jackson without Michael Jordan and et cetera, et cetera, right? You got to have the right people in the right spot for you to look good. And once I really got it, it was amazing to me. Like it took me multiple years to absorb that coach. But when I really got it is when I was able to change my destiny. So you started off with one, one brokerage, X number of agents, right? And yeah, I started off with my first brokerage. Gosh, I think we had 11 agents and it was, it was, a, it was a struggle. We were, you know, I would, I, I bought my first computers from comp USA with six months, no payment, no interest. Cause I didn't have any money. Um, we would, I assembled all the cubicles. We were in a dingy little space with wet rain stained, you know, ceiling tiles and, um, you know, really loyal and, and faithful bunch of agents. That was my first one. That was in 1996 um, up in Dallas, Texas. Yeah. And then from there, uh, you know, and, and that's also when I was getting some of this training. You know, Keller Williams does a great job as a national franchise. So I'm the largest broker owner inside Keller Williams. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, we do 5,000 agents with 12 billion in sales a year. I have a great partner in Smokey Garrett, uh, who is my CEO now. I'm kind of the chairman. But back then, there was nothing. There was me and there's 11 agents. And I had a partner in that franchise, the McKissicks. They were great producers. And we just didn't really know anything. So I just hired the first manager I could hire. And she was, um, you know, she wasn't good. And she wasn't, not only was she not good, she was kind of disloyal. And so I would try to hold her accountable. And she was older than me by a good 20 years. And uh, she'd kind of give me lip service and then go undermine me. So we got up to 30 agents or so. I was a pretty good recruiter because I hustled really hard. Um, and one day one of my agents came and said, you know, this person is saying this, this, and this about you behind your back. So not only was I bad at leverage, I almost had the opposite of a good hire. I had a sabotaging hire who was sabotaging me behind my back. Yeah. So thank, thank goodness for that great agent who loved me and cared about me and told me that truth. So I immediately let her go. I mean, it took me another year to let her go. I'll be honest. It, it wasn't easy back then to let people go. It was very difficult. But it, I did then, you know, I was taking all these courses on how to identify talent, how to hire great people. And um, I was able to replace her with somebody pretty special. And that office went on to become the number one office in Flower Mound, Texas. And today, you know, well, pre-COVID, it was, you know, making, it's made half a million a year for 10 years. It's a great little franchise. So that was my first one. Uh, the second year, I, I, I don't know how, you know, I launched a couple more. Um, one that was in the region failed and I took it over. It was kind of like this journey of failing forward bit by bit. So from sort of 97 till 2006, I went from one to 15 franchises and then in the last crash, we had to shut some down and they, some failed and we had to merge some together. And then, you know, today we're up to 12, but we have about six sub franchises, just about 20 altogether. And, and it's been a fascinating journey. Um, but yeah, the reality was when I was, when I had that one and that bad manager, uh, I worked harder than I do today with 20. Yeah. And I got about seven world-class managers, like amazing people that are just really good at what they were. My life's way easier because of leverage than it was prior to leverage. Well, I think about this because, you know, I, I've had some national contracts with national real estate companies, you know, and I go, I see one particular company that I, I, I worked with for a while. I kept just seeing, I kept having this sense as I was out on the road speaking to their, to their people that it was a dying brand, you know, and I kept saying to them, man, this is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing mm. the average age of the agent. I'm seeing little or no enthusiasm. I'm seeing pockets of the country where there's like, I don't, I don't, I just don't think it's going to continue. And they kept telling me, no, no, no. We're one of the top brands in the world. We're the best in the world. You know what I'm saying? It was really kind of a back and forth. It's kind of sad. 
um, right. of what I was seeing and experiencing. But but you're living proof that people can take and build a, a, a vibrant uh, a vibrant culture, right? That is profitable and with great people can can win in the real estate market that way because there's all kinds of pros and cons of people saying well it's hard to win and with brokers we don't make enough money as a broker right you, you hear all that noise but you know you're living proof that, that it can work if you if you if you work it right yeah when we came in we got a lot of resistance our model was different it was more aggressive it was young it was uh, very uh, recruiting based so we would recruit a lot of people and you know we we built really large offices like i have offices with four or five hundred agents in them mm. And at first there was a lot of resistance to that from, from the old guard, the traditional guys. And, uh, but what Gary Keller was pretty clear about is you're either a margin business or a volume business. In other words, you either sell small amounts with a big margin or a lot of stuff with a little margin and real estate has become a volume business. It's all about masses of scale and a smaller, tiny percentage. Like we do 12 billion in sales and our margins off of that are very small. Uh, but it's a big number, so that makes us profitable. And that way we're able to give the agents more services, have lower costs for them, and they get to, you know, get all the services of a beautiful big office because they allow me to have four or 500 agents in the office. If they didn't allow me to do that, then I'd either have to charge a lot more per agent or have a much smaller, older, dingier office, which is the way we started. Right. So, yeah, I mean, we've, we, and that I remember getting heat at one conference I was at and they were like ripping into me, like about how our model wouldn't last. And it was, you know, a Ponzi scheme or something like that. And I said, look, man, I'll go get my P and L's. I got them in my room. Why don't you get your P and L's for your office? I'll get, get my P and L's for office. Let's set them side by side. Winner pies dinner. I mean, loser buys dinner. Maybe winner should buy dinner. And uh, they wouldn't do it. And then, you know, I got actually angry and I walked out of that a little bit hot. You know, I used to run with a little bit of chip on my shoulder and just went out and built the number one real estate company in Dallas. That's what we did. We became number one in Dallas from nowhere, yeah. even though at the beginning people were mocking us. But it was just a new model. It was, uh, you know, and today when we have a convention, we have 15,000 people there. The enthusiasm is just incredible. Um, and when I joined the company, you know, there was four or five, 600 agents in it. I'm not exactly sure, but today there's 170,000. So yeah, it's been a heck of a journey and the culture is key to it. You know, we gave the agents a voice in the company, we profit share. So they've got a stake in the company. Um, we educate the crap out of people like Gary Keller's genius is education. And uh, it's been a heck of a journey, man. And, and it's shaped me as well. Like I came into it, you know, I didn't learn much in high school and college. I'll be honest. I barely made it out of college. I got thrown out of three high schools. I got a 2.2 GPA. I didn't really understand it. I didn't know why I was learning it. Why am I learning microeconomics? Why am I learning the history of, I don't know, whatever. So, and then I got into business and all of a sudden, whatever I learned directly affected my pocketbook or directly affected the way my clients felt. Mm -hmm. So I, I learned even scripts and dialogues, which I thought was kind of canned and cheesy when I first learned it. But then I learned with the right scripts and dialogues, I can help my clients get to a more satisfying outcome in a shorter, quicker manner and better serve them. So then that's when the light went on for me. And now today I'm one of the most learning based individuals that I know I'm, I'm absorbing 40 books a year and uh, listening to podcasts and taking notes and journaling and taking courses. And I'm just all in for that next level of information. When did, when did this concept of wealth can't wait pop into your mind? Because I'm a big believer that, you know, the number of books that are, that are, that come out, you know, in a, in a, in a given year, the title is so critical to pulling a person in. And, you know, I've for, for years have believed that you can't wait. I, I have a saying that there comes a time when winter asks what you did all spring and summer. Amen, brother. That's yeah. what we're at right now, by the way, with this yeah. whole COVID thing. Yeah. This is when, this is what winter feels like. So, you know, when I saw the title, I'm like, that's it, man. Your wealth can't wait. It can't wait till tomorrow. It can't wait till next year. That's right. And, and we coach a lot of people, you know, thousands of people a month. And many of them, have never built a primary skill strong enough to build demand for that skill, to build networks around that skill or product or service that, that where they even have any excess cash to begin starting their wealth building process. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. But, but when did it hit you? This is the book I want to write called wealth can't wait. How did that come to you? Well, honestly, my dad was dying of cancer. He died in 2008 and I, I was saddened by the fact that he was going to take a lot of stories, mostly war stories with him. He was a good storyteller and he was a big personality. And so while I was sitting beside him, I mean, it took him three years to die, but the last year was pretty rough. 2008, I took some time off. You know, I was able to, I had a great team. I had leverage. So because of that, I was able to be a great son and spend time with him. And while he was dying, I just thought, you know, if I died tomorrow, what would I leave behind me? 
And I thought, you know, I would leave nothing. So let's write a book. I don't have the stories like my dad has, but I have a lot of success in business. So that's where it started. Um, and, and I knew all along that I would write. In fact, my second book, Miracle Morning Millionaires, my third book, Tribe of Millionaires, they're all built around wealth because really that's been my thing. Like for me, I grew up, my mom was the poor offshoot of a wealthy family. Uh, my dad had, you know, they were all mostly dead, all his relatives. And we just didn't have a lot of money. We didn't grow up with a lot of money. We were the middle of the middle class, so nor do I have a bunch of sob stories about us being dead broke because we weren't, but we were middle of the middle class. My dad made 260 bucks a month, I think, as a military guy, but you get housing and all the rest of it. Um, I always knew that I wanted freedom. And for me, freedom meant wealth. And so I worked hard as a kid. I worked hard at construction jobs. I had a lawn mowing company. I worked hard as a grocery bagger. I thought I was the fastest grocery bagger in the store, except for this one kid that had really long arms. But uh, that was all in my dome, though. That was not a public competition. Um, and so, you know, yeah, that's what I went to work on. By 2007, I'd achieved a pretty good amount of success, making over a million bucks a year. And then the crash came and everything kind of came down. Uh, but even then, I wasn't that stressed. I mean, it's like right now. Now is winter because I did the right thing. Like a farmer, I stored up some nuts or a squirrel in the, in the spring and the summer. I'm okay. Like, I'm not worried. I'm not thrilled. I'd rather things were the way they were, but they're not. But nor am I fearful, right? Because, and also, I, I will say the 08 crash scared me worse. Um, but, you know, we recovered from that. We ended up doing real well after it. But if you go back to your folks that are like at the very beginning, the key is to do exactly what you said. It's just develop a skill. The marketplace pays you based on a value you bring to the marketplace. It's, it's not personal. It's not uh, favoritist. I mean, there's definitely advantages and disadvantages. Don't get me wrong. There's privileged people and unprivileged people. It took me a while to get that, but I really do get it now. But what there isn't is favoritism to the marketplace. If you make a better Facebook than Facebook, everyone will gravitate to your Facebook. If you make a better shoe than Nike, everyone will wear your shoe. There's, it's a blind marketplace pretty much. Um, and so your goal is to deliver something of value. And if that's to be a lawyer or a doctor or a contractor or a home builder, um, you just have to develop that skill as much as possible and put the time into it and not really, you know, don't spend all your time watching Netflix. I mean, what a great time now that we're all quarantined at home to listen to the podcasts, to read the books, to do the push-ups, to do the jumping jacks. To, you know, it's all fundamental. Everyone knows what it takes to be successful. You just got to do more of it and, and, you know, get a certain amount of discipline around it. And that's why I've loved real estate so much all the time, coach, because real estate is just, it's the greatest place for the everyday guy to become wealthy. It's, it's not, you don't have to build an iPhone. You could put me in a room with all the material in the world and I could never build an iPhone. You give me forever. How about forever? I can never put together an iPhone, but I can buy a crappy house. I can put some effort into fixing it up, slow, throw some paint on it, make it look pretty, find a tenant, stick them in it or flip it and make some money. And it's a great way to build wealth and you could do it on the side or, in, you know, and so I mean, to your listeners, again, you got to work on yourself harder than you work on your job. That's the, that's the truth. And that's fortunately something I started doing after college. Up in the way through college, I worked hard, but I had no clue what I was doing. After college, when I got into business and it made a difference, I started really developing myself and the light switched on, came on for me. And what I realized is what I do, what, what I develop in myself is more important than anything I do in the real world. Yeah. When you give us your wealth formula, you know, my formula, I talk about one of my books is called single digit millionaire and people say, well, why did you write single digit millionaire? And, and I said, well, you, you got to become a single digit millionaire before you can become a double digit millionaire. Yeah. And, and, you know, less than 4% of small businesses ever break a million dollars of even revenue. Yeah. So the likelihood of you having any money to, to actually go, you know, I was a high school basketball coach making 60,000 a year working working 80 hours a week, no matter how much I want, I couldn't make any more money at that, in that, in that vehicle. Yes. Which is, then I started making more in an hour than I did in a month when I started speaking and coaching. Then, then I started putting that money into real estate and, 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 and leveraging that money into bigger deals, right? And so mm -hmm. I went from a high school basketball coach to a multimillionaire. And that's what the book Single Digit Millionaire is about. But I have a nice. formula that I yeah. use looking back. What's your, what's your formula? Yeah, you know, it, it's going to sound boring, but it's just live below your means, save capital and put capital to work. You got to realize every dollar you have should be a soldier or an employee going to work for you to make dollars. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you get that, you realize that if you make 60,000 a year, you can save 6,000 a year. You should be able to save 10% of your income every year. Now that's boring. I'm, and I'm not saying it's, I'm not a huge advocate of the millionaire next door, although it really does work. So I believe in it. But I believe in doing more where you did transitioning to where the money is in addition to So you should always start like the millionaire next door, mm -hmm. save capital, invest that capital, hold that capital, 
responsible for a rate of return. If you think about it this way, so I would buy a house, live in it for two years, then I'd move and buy another house and turn my first one into a rental. So you think about it this way, I got a rental property, I'm living in another house and I have a job, even if I'm only making 60,000 a year. Now that, that rental property has a tenant in it, paying rent every month, paying off my mortgage, and also keep giving me maybe a hundred bucks a month, nothing exciting, extra cash flow. But over time, that there's a wealth tree that I've planted. And one of my philosophies is plant trees and manage orchards. So I've planted a tree, it's cash flowing, and now I just gotta occasionally water it. And water it is look at you, make sure you're getting your rent check, make sure it has repairs taken care of. So a little bit of tending, a little bit of nurturing, and, and that tree grows up and over time becomes paid for. I have 101 single family homes. They now make me a half a million dollars a year without any work. I do because I have now hired a guy to manage all my managers. So there's zero work, 500,000 a year into my bank account, but it started with that one property in 1995 that I bought in Austin, Texas for $77,000, which I refied in 2001 and took out 60 grand and bought three more properties. That was four properties, all sub $100,000 properties that I own to this day, right? So that's Planting a tree requires more effort. That was identifying the property, finding a tenant to put in the property, making sure it's fixed up and working and nice, make sure it cash flows, doing the analysis. That's the work. I planted the tree. I plant it. And now I collect the rent checks. That's like the fruit growing on the orange tree, right? So now I have, you know, the 50 businesses you mentioned, the 100 rental properties, the multifamily I'm in. They're just fruit in my orchard. They're orchard, you know, they're trees in my orchard that bear fruit for me on a regular basis. So my philosophy of that, that's really leverage also. It's a different kind of leverage. It's leveraging your capital. So we talked about human leverage. There's capital leverage. And every dollar you have should be responsible for at least a 10% return. So every dollar you have should work, go to work and make you about 10 cents a year. That doesn't have to be free cash flow. It could be 6% in cash flow and 4% in, in uh, appreciation or debt pay down. Um, you know, that's kind of my philosophy is grind it out, build that capital. And then the piece that's a little different from the, you know, Millionaire Next Door or Richest Man in Babylon, which are good books is, um, you know, the, take, take more risk. I've always been a risk guy. So I just take more risks. And, and when you went out on your speaking career, that was more risk. Um, buying a franchise for me was more risk. Buying rental properties, that, that's been risky. Uh, I started a private equity firm a couple of years ago. That's risky. Like I've embraced the risk. And what I used to fear was the risks I was taking. I would stay awake in, at night watching the ceiling fan spin, fearful of all the things I'd gotten myself into. And then at one point I realized my biggest fear now is that I'm not taking enough risk. My biggest fear now is that I'm not, not being stupid. I don't want to imply stupidity. Um, I'm not going to go balls out, you know, crazy all out like some people do. I'm not going 100, 101 miles an hour down the highway, but I'm definitely going, you know, 70 miles an hour. The speed limit is 65, I'm going 70. I'm going hard. And, and I'm looking for those opportunities to deploy my capital, not blow it because Warren Buffett is right. Rule number one is don't lose capital. And rule number two is see rule number one. So don't blow it. But just like in the Bible, it says, don't bury your talent and come back a year later and expect everyone to be happy with you. You got to take your five talents and turn it into 10 talents, right? That's the thing. So there's a way to do that. And it's, and it's not hard, man. I'm a C student, right? And now I'm financially free, but the risk piece is something a little different for me. That's like, that's how you accelerate the success. Because even if you bought a franchise and you fail completely and it's a disaster, you learn more in two years. You open a Subway sandwich, it goes bad, you lose all your money. And in two years, you just got a morbid education you get going to Harvard and getting an MBA. Well, let's talk about that because the, the risk piece, I think, separates. I, I've, got a, I've got a buddy that, I, that I've coached who is a real, real estate agent. When I started coaching him, he was doing 45 deals a year and making 80000 a year. Okay, now six years later, he's, he's doing 45 deals a month, making 80,000 a month, right? Yeah. A significant mm -hmm. jump. Yeah. But he said to me one day, because now he lives in a nicer house and he, he actually was able to pick up a, a good looking woman. <laughs> yeah. Got some money. And, you know, he's funny he's, how that works. He, you know, he said to me one day, he said, Coach, the people that have never been to the other side don't really understand what they're m missing, right? And what yeah. he said was, when you become wealthier, okay, I mean, I, I mean, I live in Tennessee, right, outside of Nashville, and, and, and a person earning a million dollars of personal income in this area is pretty wealthy because it's, yeah. the cost of living is lower, right? If, that, if we were yeah. in New York City, we, it wouldn't be as wealthy, but, but there's just not a lot of people, you know, especially in the city I live in, which is 30 minutes, that, that earn a million dollars personal or right. 2 million or 10 million. And what he was saying is, if you get to the other side, what, what once was considered a, a luxury is now considered a necessity, right? That's and, true. And, and so 
it's hard to explain to people what the other side looks like. Like, like yeah. I can look at you and say, man, look at what this dude has been able to do. He wasn't just a real estate agent. He started a real estate brokerage and then he started private equity and then he did this and then he took risk and look at the life he gets to live. Now, why wouldn't everybody want that life? Yeah. Why do you think it's hard to explain when the, this other side concept? You know, it, I've got a similar concept, so it's kind of neat hearing it because one thing I know is when you get to a certain level of success, you find that there's patterns to it and models to it and everyone you meet that's successful kind of speaks a similar language. There's like a harmony to it. I've always thought the other side was kind of like this. You're on one side where you want to play safe. And that's where you keep your corporate job. You put your money in your 401k. You invest in ETFs or whatever. You're just keeping it safe, right? The other side is where, you know, you see the guy making a million a year or having all these properties or what have you. And you're like, oh, that looks terrifying. I am terrified to go across that bridge. Bridge is a little shaky, by the way. It's an old rope bridge that kind of sways in the wind to that other side where I'm working is, you know, my capital works for me and I'm an entrepreneur and I'm not safe anymore. Everything depends on me, uh, not my safe job. And that to me is, and then, but the guys that have grown across the other side, and I know like hundreds and hundreds of financially free people, you know, in our tribe of millionaires group, we have a large number of millionaires. And, 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 and when we get over there, we all look back going to the people that are still on the other side. It's not that bad. That, that bridge it's scary, but it ain't that hard. It's not nearly as hard as you think it is. But for some reason, I think, you know, we're just wired for safety. You know, we didn't, we didn't, it wasn't survival of the fittest because we were able to wrestle a saber tooth tiger down with our bare hands and beat the crap out of it. We kind of worked in a pack. Uh, probably the more brave guys got eaten more often. So a lot of people are like hanging back a little bit, um, you know, and Ultimately, there's a lot of safety instinct in a human being. Heck, the whole being is to stay alive, and we aren't the biggest animal. So we definitely had to duck and dodge and bob and weave uh, to not get trampled by a woolly mammoth. So there's this huge innate wiring towards playing it safe. But the truth is, in America, almost no one starves to death. Almost no one doesn't have shelter. You know, the homeless have a lot of issues. It's not always just because they got bad luck. I mean, most people that are homeless are homeless temporarily, and they get back on their feet. So, you know, I just think that the risk reward is way better to take the risk and people under, uh, they overestimate the damage that can be done by the risks they take instead of just getting after it, taking risks, letting the lessons fall. And then they're on the other side, that's where I am with my tribe of people and with you and other guys that have been successful. We look back trying to tell people, it ain't that bad, man. It, I swear to you, just buy a second rental property, invest in a multifamily deal, do something to change your life destiny. And yes, it doesn't change immediately. It takes a long time, but if you keep plugging away, suddenly that orchard will bear you a lot of fruit. But if you never plant a second tree, then you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. I mean, you just got to count on social security and your 401k and whatever. And if that's how you want to play it, I don't judge that, but I just think it's way easier than people think that it is. And if they would all just take a little bit more of a risk and a bit more of a chance, they'd find you know, I tell you, the guys I know that are rich are no smarter than the guys I know that are playing it safe and aren't rich and have a regular job. It's not brains that does it. Well, you'll appreciate this. I was, I was, when I first made a, my, my first hundred thousand dollars of personal income, you know, I, I was in a coaching program where you had to show your tax returns to get in. Nice. I like it. And, and, and so I'm like, okay, I make 106,000 bucks. I go to the coaching program and I'm in one room with all the people that earn between a hundred and 250,000. Let's be strategic coach. Wouldn't there you go. There you go. Yeah. Let's strategic coach. And, and I was in there for three years because I was a basketball coach and it was incredibly valuable for me to learn entrepreneurial structures. Oh yeah. I did it for one year. It was great. And uh, well then in the next room directly beside me was the, a million dollar group. Right. And Sullivan was going back and forth that day between the hundred thousand dollar group and the million dollar group. And a guy in our class raised his hand and said, Dan, I got a quick question for you. What is the difference between the guys over there earning a million plus a year and the people over here earning 10,000, I mean, a hundred thousand a year. Uh -huh. He said, oh, oh, that's simple. He said, when I tell those guys to do something, they do it. When I tell you guys to do something, you give me 10 reasons why it won't work. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's brilliant. Now, let, let, what's, your, what's your personal feelings about debt? What's your, because, because if you yeah. study, like, 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 one day I was speaking somewhere to financial advisors, okay? And I brought in all of the books that either people had given me or I'd purchased on financial freedom. And mm -hmm. I brought everything from Kiyosaki. Here's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Here's the millionaire next door. Here's Cardo what Cardone says. 
here's what so-and-so says, here's what all these people say, here's what Dave Ramsey says, and I just, one at a time, just threw them up in the floor. Because I said, once you get done reading all these books, even Tony Robbins has got books out now about money, I yeah. said, what you end up being is confused, uh -huh. right? Because everybody has all these philosophies, and, and, and it's tough to decide, who do I follow? Who right. do I listen to here? What's your personal thoughts about, about debt and the usage of debt? Yeah, and, and everything I've done, you know, is, is uh, hard knocks and learning and living. So uh, I think there's good debt and bad debt. And good debt is debt that makes you more money and bad debt is debt, debt that eats your money. So good debt is money or rental property. Like when I refied that Austin property and took out 60 grand to buy three more rental properties, that's good debt. Bad debt is the debt that I have on my credit card or my, my car. You know, it doesn't make me money. Um, good debt, you could argue, on my principal residence, having a million dollar loan, which I borrowed at three percent, which I can then invest the money and make fifteen percent. It could you could twist that into being good debt. If you have a multifamily complex and uh, let's say it's got two million in debt and that makes you ten percent on your money, that's good debt. If you went to three million and it made you fifteen percent on your money, that's also good debt. But if you went to three million and it made you five percent on your money, that's bad debt. So it's just called positive versus negative leverage. Negative leverage eats your, you know, takes you down in return. Positive leverage takes you up in return. So that's my overall philosophy on debt. I have debt. I used to be afraid of it. I used to try to have, you know, more paid off assets, but I'm still not highly leveraged. I'm probably against my net worth. I probably have about 35% leverage and on average assets, I'm, I try to stay 65, 70%. Now, I've seen guys, Coach Michael, come along and leverage it 95% and time it just right and make tens of millions of dollars. I know a, a guy in particular made about 40 million. He started buying stuff around 2013 and he sold it all in 2018. Wow. And he, it wasn't that he was smart. It was just, it wasn't that part. He's a smart guy, but that part was, he didn't get in and get out. That was just, he was a, he was like a chemical engineer, got bored of that, tried, just decided to buy multifamily, went all in crazy big. And then he and his partner had a conflict and he sold everything in 18. Does that make sense? So he made 40 million bucks. But when I was looking at his deals in 14, I was like, man, if the wind blows against this guy, he's going down because everything is 95% leverage. Paid off for him. I know other guys that went heavy leverage in 06, negative net worth. So I try to keep a 20, 30% cushion because I would rather not try to be a billionaire. I'd rather stay between 10 million and, and uh, 800 million somewhere in there and not take, or let's say even 200 million, 10 million to 200 million and never take crazy risks and also be very aggressive, if that makes sense. But I'm not trying to be stupid aggressive because I don't really care. I don't think it makes a difference to be worth 900 million versus 200 million. There's no difference in your lifestyle. There's a difference if you're mentally wired to compete over money, 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 but I'm not. I want to be a great dad. I want to be a great husband as well. And if I was committed to being a billionaire, it would be a distraction to me. So I'm trying to win, play smart, be aggressive, but not 99% leverage, 110, 120% leverage. It is a way to go. And if you time it just right, it will pay off. But with my strategy, I rode through all of the downturns. I had assets in 06 that went down in value. I had assets... I had buildings, I had loans, and I never had to once give anything back or get bankruptcy because I always required cash flow and at least 20 to 30% equity. And I never lost, I never went below that. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. I want to be respectful every time because you've given us that and thank you for that. Um, yes, sir. When you, when you think about this concept of, uh, let's take, let's take this tribe of millionaires. Yeah. What is that? Well, we created a group in, in 13 called GoBundance. And GoBundance is a group of, you have to be, you got a threshold, net worth threshold. You got to be a millionaire to get in or 250,000 in income. And um, it's where we have a tribe of people where being awesome is normal. And we have accountability. We have genuine contribution, age-defying health, financial freedom, bucket list adventures, and authentic relationships is our six kind of rules. And what I will tell you is that the easiest way to win is to hang out with winners. Yep. The easiest way to absorb the lessons, you can coach me all day long and I'm going to pick it up to some degree. But if the guy next to me, who I think is no better than me, is taking your wisdom and doing better than me with it, I'm like, I got to do what Coach Michael said. Because, not because you said it, because you could say it a hundred times and sometimes I hear it and sometimes I don't. But when Pat, who's my brother, starts doing what you said and he's getting ahead of me, I'm like, whoa, 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 that ain't right. Like, if there's something about 
a peer group of people that are committed to being better that will drive you to be better. Um, you know, and it's iron sharpens iron like a man, you know, man sharpens man. It's, it's old stuff. It's been around thousands of years, this concept. So we created this tribe. A lot of people that succeed at a high level end up sort of being lonely because they can't talk, talk to some of their buddies. Like you hang out with your high school buddies and if they're having a hard time paying rent it's, it, and you talk about your life, you sound like you're bragging. Yeah. Um, you have to kind of either diminish yourself or be kind of a lone wolf. And so we created a tribe where being excellent is kind of normal and where we stand for one another's greatness. And you can say, Hey, I made a million bucks on a deal last month and people slap you on the back and they don't try to slap you in the face. I love it. What a great concept. You're a cool dude, man. You've done a lot. You are too, coach. I like you a lot too, man. I'd be fired up if you were my coach. Yeah. You've done a lot. You've done a lot in your life to be such a young man. And I want to commend you on that. And I want to close this off. By, uh, by asking a question, because I'm working on this this new book. I think I'm going to get a, a big book deal on on Pray Drive. That's kind of my niche area of activating that in people. And I, Pray I, Drive. P-R-E-Y-D-R-I-V-E. It's okay. It's prevalent in animals, specifically yeah. dogs. But I okay. the conclusion that humans have this Pray Drive, it just has to be activated. Yeah. And then there has to be a persistence to it and an intensity to it. So I've kind of codified it. And uh, I'm always interested when I spend time with guys like you, I'm going to give you five activators and I want you to tell me what you think your number one activator is of that drive. Okay. You got uh, it. Competition is an activator of prey drive. Okay. Two, fear of loss or fear of losing what you've created is an activator of prey drive. Uh, environment, kind of like your tribe of millionaires. When you're around other big time people, that is an activator of prey drive. Exposure where you're exposed to, to new ideas, new concepts, new thought processes. And I also say embarrassment. And I don't mean by a coach embarrassing you, but like you've come to the conclusion that you're so much greater than what you're showing, right? It's more, you're more motivated by potential than you are by pain. Which, which would you say of those five are, would, be, would be the primary activator of your prey drive? Man, it's hard to pick one because all of those have a, a resonance with me. But, you know, uh, I would say probably competition. I mean, honestly, I wasn't a great athlete. I was kind of a dorky little kid, and I always was angry that no one would pick me. And then when they did, I wasn't that good. And it used to piss me off, excuse my language, but I was, that I wasn't that good too. Like it all, I just had this, I never got satisfaction in high school as like a stud or anybody else. I wasn't on the outs. I just wasn't on the ins. I never got in my family. I was the littlest. I was the youngest. Yeah. And I just never got satisfaction until I found in business. And then I was like, you know, I'm going to go show that this little guy has something in him. Yeah. And then the other one I almost chose would be fear of loss. Now, what's, what's changed me the most has been environment and possibly embarrassment, some of those. Yeah. But I hate losing, man. Like you, yeah. winning, I don't get as much joy out of. But when I'm losing, I absolutely hate it. Yeah, I would say it's competition for you. And, and you know, mine's fear of loss and, or, or fear of – maybe fear of, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe not being good enough or, or, or thinking that like when I speak at these big conferences, I'll, I'm always the underdog, right? It's like, he's the new guy. Yeah. You know, like when I spoke at 10 X, I'm the new, he's the new, he's the up and coming guy. He's the new guy. And that, that underdog mentality always motivated me. Like, let, yeah. me, let me get in the game, man. You put me on that stage and I'll show you what I've been working my whole life for. So it's interesting with big time people, what is that primary activator? So I always like to ask, people of interest where would freedom fit into that because the other thing i always wanted was freedom and i think part of that's having controlling mom controlling dad pretty intense military type upground i was like i never want to be trapped by anybody again you know i, I think when i as i've been studying this because to, to write this book i've studied basically every motivational theory available there's about 20 yep. out there. and they all say the same thing we move toward things we want biologically physiologically i, I actually believe there's probably about 20 activators of prey drive i believe you know freedom would be one I believe there's, there's other autonomy, mastery, purpose. These are ones that I see a lot as coaching a lot of people. Uh, and so I'm trying to continue to boil it down so it's not as complicated when I write the book. And I also think the drives could change because if you think of Maxwell, he goes a struggle, success, significance. There may be some other ones right. in the middle, but that's the general concept. When I was struggling and I wanted to make it, I was like, don't you misjudge me. Don't you underestimate me. There was a lot of like competition. Yeah. Then I got to a certain level of success and now I'm at significance. And now I kind of like to think I'm more motivated by contribution. I love seeing other people succeed. Yep. Um, being a great dad is part of that, you know, so contribution is now a drive for me. And part of that was mastery. 
um, balance, just really like having it all. So my, I changed my competitive drive from just making money to is it possible to have it all, which means great health, great relationships, be a great human, contribute back to others, be a great dad and be a great businessman and make a bunch of money. So that's, I think the drives could shift as you achieve different levels of success. Well, I will close on this because I think this is important for people to know. If you really study, what's interesting, if you study prey driving animals, specifically dogs, it's not actually ca capturing the prey that makes the dog the happiest. It's the ability to pursue the prey. Nice. The pursuit becomes the reward. Got and, it. And, and I think I see a lot of big time people that they need to fight. They need to be involved. They need to be pursuing something. That's when they're their happiest. Yeah. That's funny. That's great. I love that. That was a fun talk right there, Michael. Hey, I enjoyed it, Coach. man. David Osborne, pick up a copy of his books. Uh, I've got Wealth Can't Wait, and I have it on my way out. So, you know, this is to pay homage to you. On my way out of my house every day, um, I get my bag to come to the office. I get my things, and I've got your book just sitting right there as a reminder to me that your wealth can't wait. And so, Outstanding. So uh, I, I got a lot of books, but I put them in strategic places to remind me of certain things. So your book is there every day before I leave. So thank you, man. That's contribution. I hope to do more things with you, and I'm certainly going to come to Austin at some point and see you. I'd love to meet you sometime. Thanks for having me on, Coach. All right, big guy. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Coach Michael Burt, and the number one book that I've written over the last couple of years that could help you during these unusual times is a book I wrote called Inside the Mind of a Monster. Now I wanna give you that book. All you have to do is text 678-506-7543. Because when you text that in, I'm gonna give you a copy of my book, Inside the Mind of a Monster. And it's gonna show you the habits and mindsets of top producers and how they attack every single day versus play defense. Don't you wanna play offense? Get this book, I'm giving it to you. And I'm telling you, I'm going to turn you into a legendary creature.